From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deckant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. At the very top, we need to say that today's episode may contain information that is not suitable for all members of the audience. And candidly, the subject of today's episode got to me which very rarely happens. It's a tale of quiet desperation. It's a tale of a real global cabal and the looming existential threat of nuclear annihilation all occurring just under the glitzy surface of unprecedented American prosperity. I mean, what do you guys think of when you think of the 1950s, post-war America? Everybody has a home. Everybody has a bunch of cool gadgets that are filling up that home that are making life easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. The future uh, is what that felt like. But, you know, the past. I don't know. I don't know. Retro futures. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, That's exactly what I was getting at. You said it much better, Ben. Um, But no, it's true. It's that that kind of like idyllic, you know, clip art kind of American dream sense uh, with also this like, you know, uh, absolutely terrifying underbelly just beneath the surface, kind of ready to, you know, devour everyone whole. Mm, Well said. In some ways, this is a study of two very different worlds existing concurrently. On one world, we have a shiny universe of brand new homes and automobiles, solid jobs, 2.5 happy kids in suburbs across the country. The other world is a world of vast and true conspiracy, a violation that we still don't fully understand the extent of. It's a profound crime nearly a century old, and the consequences of it remain with us in the modern day. This is a horror story, folks. But let's talk about the fun part first. Here are the facts. So the 1950s for the world, not just the U.S., it's the post-World War II time, which for a lot of intents and purposes was great because it was such a devastating period that it occurred just before the 1950s. And there's a feeling of rebirth that's coming out of that stuff. Um, and, and in particular in the United States as who, you know, we're seen at least according to our news and all the history I've ever learned, we're seen as the victors. We're seen as the ones who really brought victory home for the world. Yeah. I, I, I would say that, you know, the 1950s were a particularly great time for a big segment of the U S population. Uh, and they were an exception to the rule. Because the 1950s were horrible for for a lot of the rest of the world uh, due to that enormous devastation that we're alluding to in World War II. The U.S. was very much in what is called the catbird seat, Uh, a little idiom that I love but still don't completely understand. Please explain it somewhat. Well, well, the fighting didn't happen on American soil, right? Right. Our cities were not destroyed, the way much of Europe was. Right, right, exactly. So there are two big factors here. First, the Americans are the inventors of nuclear technology, also the first country to deploy this disastrous weapon in the field. So the U.S. emerges as one of the world's most deadly military forces. In fact, the most deadly military force on Earth. And that's that's something that continues today. And also geography played a huge role. The U.S. was isolated by two enormous oceans. It was really expensive to get over there, right? And because of that, they avoided that destruction. They still had a manufacturing base that had been accelerated through, you know, the war effort. So we're making more stuff than ever before. We're the, we're like, if the world is a suburb, we're the only house that didn't get hit by the tornado, Kind of. And and people were worried about this. 
the world is full of pessimists, of course, right? And there were numerous experts who were arguing back and forth about the uncertain future because everybody knew unemployment rates had fluctuated widely over just the past few decades. In the 1930s, around one out of four people were out of work due to the Great Depression. Still a terrible name. Well, it wasn't a particularly great depression. It was a terrible depression, uh, but it was, you know, the big one. Um, but yeah, the, the war effort um, caused industrialization because, you know, all of that stuff was needed to aid the war effort with infrastructure and, and machinery, of weapons of war, et cetera. Uh, by 1944, unemployment had precipitously dropped to 1.2%. Uh, and this, even to this day, is a record low. And uh, everyone and, you know, uh, their mother, sister, dog, brother, uh, everyone was working. Um, economists were concerned that this was like a bubble that was going to pop. This was not sustainable. Had the United States become addicted to war, were we going to have to face it that we were addicted to war? It's possible. Uh, was global conflict now just an absolute necessity? Or was this something that we were going to have to continue to almost, you know, lean into in order to save our economy? Uh, it certainly feels like it sometimes, even today. Um, folks like Senator James Mead believe that the U.S. would never be able to successfully convert from a military economy to a civilian one. And and this becomes sort of like this boogeyman of these these visions of things that were only just recently, you know, out of people's you know daily lives. Things like these decaying factories uh, and those huge, horrible unemployment numbers. Um, so people were spooked and they were going to do whatever it took to kind of keep things on the up and up. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, part of uh, being an economic expert or a politician like Senator Meade is uh, a big part of that is being the person who goes into a good situation and starts naming all the reasons it will be terrible shortly. You're, you're paid to ruin the party. Uh, luckily, Meade and the other experts were proven incorrect in their predictions. Those unique advantages we mentioned for the U.S. paved the way for the post-war economic boom. Paul, can we get some music? Okay, perfect. Yeah, exactly that. So the study of the U.S. in the 1950s is, I would argue, best understood as a study in paradox. Like, life was great. Life was aces for a lot of white people who towed the correct ideological lines. But the horror of racism remained. Uh, the, the civil rights movement was in its nascent stages. Uh, the Red Scare of communism cost people their livelihoods. There was terror behind America's shiny new smile. But on the bright side, Paul, bring back the happy music. Business was booming. Everything was. That's why we call that generation the baby boomers. Think of it like after years of rations and shortages and insane propaganda, people are kind of like um, the folks in countries that were able to end the pandemic. You know, they're desperate to get outside, get some action, enjoy the good life. And man, they loved spending money. It was a veritable shopping spree going on in the U.S. <laughs> And like we said before, homes were one of the biggest things that people were buying and moving into. And of course, there are bills that we've mentioned before on this show that were available to help people who needed homes, who needed to be able to afford one. Cars were huge. Uh, I mean, you're just going to you had to have a car and you had to be able to drive fairly long distances. A lot of times, you know, again, there's a lot of parts of the economy were just required a ton of travel and because you have homes, because you have nice cars, you fill them up with things because there's space in there. And there are all these companies that are manufacturing things that are specifically designed for all of these new homeowners, all of these new car owners. Uh, and uh, a lot of that stuff ends up being, like I mentioned at the top, appliances. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love those. I am a sucker for the retro television stuff, please send us your favorite weird commercials from the 50s and 60s, but not the Ronald McDonald one. Ooh. I won't have it. <laughs> no. Uh, that dude was always creepy to me. I, 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 it doesn't surprise me that they kind of phased him out a bit, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did. The original Ronald McDonald is uh, 
a spooky, spooky dude. But yes, this the culture became uh, something that defined success and even morality in terms of material. It was both good and just to have new things. Uh, the The population of the U.S. was heavily incentivized to become consumers, more so than citizens. And the reason this happened is uh, because of what you were talking about earlier, Noel, the real fear that industry would die without the incentive to create more and more weapons of war. So like automobile manufacturers who came to the rescue during World War II went back, like they stopped making engines for planes and stuff like that, or making bombers like Ford did. And they went back to making cars and they were like, we got to move these whips. So people were very encouraged to buy this stuff. New car sales quadrupled between 1945 and 1955. This is back in the day when it wasn't a terrible idea to buy a brand new car. By the end of the 1950s, like 75% of American households had at least one car. That's a huge change. Also, people were f***ing like crazy. Oh, were, what? Oh, yeah, that. Oh, yeah. The yield baby boom, you say? <laughs> okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, the war was over. Times are good. Things are great. My house is filled with silver things that can nuke things. Uh, microwave. I've microwave. got all this petroleum <laughs> jelly laying around. Like, <laughs> what, what am I going to do with myself? Not that, no, not that. No. Uh, but the, uh, it's we're going to talk about it a little bit. But it's interesting how you can see this as an as an ideological shift from hot warfare, from warfare actual to cultural warfare in a way, and how all of these things that are being produced are in some ways promoting the American way, the right. the right. Cons- the capitalist ideal. And it's really interesting to see that, like you're, you're depicting here, Ben, a necessary shift for the economy to continue on. Yeah. So this is, so we, we're painting, I think, the, um, the propagandistic image which happened because of, for very real and valid reasons, in this time of prosperity for a portion of uh, the American population, about 4 million children are born each and every year during the 1950s. That's the, that is the baby boomer generation. And for so many people, this is still what a lot of people mean when they refer to the American dream, right? This is back when depending on your demographic, of course, you could, without going into debt uh, at a college, you could get a solid job out of high school. You could buy a house. You could buy a car. You could buy two cars. You could afford to have kids. Uh, Every so often, you might celebrate your anniversary or whatever with a, a nice trip, maybe to Hawaii. I don't know what people did. Is this where kind of the middle class started becoming a thing? Because they were the ones that bought all this shit, right? Yeah, so they, there's kind of that feedback loop, right? People are making more money than they did before, and they're putting it back in the economy, which also employs them. There is a good argument that an economy is a Ponzi scheme, or capitalism is, but <laughs> story well, it's an Ouroboros at the very least, right? It's the snake eating its own tail, and as long as it continues the cycle, then it'll continue to exist. I'm probably oversimplifying it, but it certainly feels a little bit... Like a fairy tale, kind of, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this I, I agree. And I, I don't think you're oversimplifying it uh, very much. You know, this is what was happening. And even now, uh, some people will look back at that and ignore all the domestic problems that were occurring and say those were the good old days. But this dream had a dark side because despite the measurable improvements in the lives of so many Americans, experts, both domestic and and abroad knew that there were storms gathering on the horizon. Nuclear weaponry, the other big advantage of the U.S., is a Pandora's jar, and now the lid was unscrewed, the seal was broken, that radioactive gin wasn't going back in the bottle anytime soon. So the average American, whatever you want to take that to mean, was basking in this moment of unprecedented prosperity But U.S. politicians, military officials, and scientists were racing against the clock to prevent their enemies from acquiring nuclear weapons. They ultimately failed in this pursuit. 
They also continued to experiment with nukes. They were desperate to maintain this strategic edge for as long as possible. Consequences be damned. Because, you know, we use the phrase allies, right? When we're talking about that World War II alliance, but uh, history proves it might be better to call them the frenemies because, <laughs> you know, the Cold War basically started like the day after World War II ended. I think I think maybe the U.S. and Russia took an afternoon off and then they were like, all right, back at it, but quieter this time. Yes, it's so quiet. It's almost silent. And there's a desperation behind it, you guys. And it leads us to what we're going to talk about today, an actual daggum conspiracy for real. Really? For really real? Yes. Forever, um, ever? Forever, ever. Because Uncle Sam, the government of the United States of America, wasn't fit to just sit with those nuclear weapons and say, we are king now of destruction. We win. Ha ha. They wanted to see what else could be done with these weapons. How far could this be taken? What else can be done? With this technology. And oh boy. Yeah. Tell them about it, dude. Well, I mean, it's understandable, right? Because they knew that the number one goal of every other country capable of doing so was to get nukes. Everybody wants the new toy, everybody wants the biggest gun. You know, like imagine if you were in the universe of Ghostbusters and you found out that you could build your own Gozer the Destroyer. That's that's what people were doing. And this is dangerous because in a very real way, this means that the world as we knew it could end at any given moment. And although everyone at this time was very much aware of the devastating impact a nuclear weapon could create, everyone knew about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but no one, not even the experts, understood the full extent of fallout. How did it affect the atmosphere? How long did it stay? Could dropping a bomb in, you know, Nepal later create fallout in Europe? Things like that. These questions um, were things you could model and you could try to test, and they definitely did, but they were also racing to learn more about how this affected ecosystems and organisms. They were driven, we have to say, by desperation. And as we continue, that's that's something everybody needs to remember. These people did not see themselves as villains. But that desperation is how we ended up with a ghoulish plan called Project Sunshine. We'll be back after the break. Here's where it gets crazy. So, you know, um, you've got these nuclear weapons, you know what they do in theory. You've tested them on, you know, you've, you've done nuclear test detonations, etc. But what do they do to people? What do they do to human flesh and human bodies? You can do them with animals and in various environments, lacking humans. Honestly, there were a lot more animals back then, Ben, you pointed out. So the ethics of this was not m as much of a concern as it certainly would be today. But it's, a, again, about how it affects that human tissue. What's it going to do? Uh, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission created something called Project Gabriel, which was an investigation to figure out uh, the full impact on the human population in a nuclear fallout zone. Through this project, uh, the government concluded that the most dangerous part of this whole situation was the radioactive isotope known as strontium-90, um, which is a calcium-like radioactive substance that is produced when nuclear explosions occur. Um, it can be absorbed by plants uh, and animals, and it passes through food to humans, and humans' bones can absorb it too. And if I'm not mistaken, this is where... Uh, a certain form of, is it iodine? Or there's some some pill you can ingest that will block the absorption of that isotope. Well, I don't know. You, first thing you have to do to figure out if something like that would function is you need to get those isotopes into human bones well, Exactly, exactly. Right? You got to test them. You got to test it out. Did it go from that cattle into Bill? 
<laughs> to Bill, yes. Uh, Bill drew the short end of the straw at the lab. So he's out there, you know, drinking milk straight from the udder just to see if he could get radiation through it. It was it was a weird, weird gig for Bill. But, the, but you're right. They needed this data. They needed to figure out what happened when the radioactive rubber hit the road, which means they needed human test subjects. They needed human tissue. The AEC commissioner at the time, a guy named Dr. Willard Libby, complained about this constantly because he, he knew the score. He knew what was up. He was like, look, it's ugly, but we're trying to save the world here. We need people. Because yeah, remember, they're not, they're not just worried about their bombs. They're worried about other countries developing the tech and then dropping it on them. Exactly. Yeah. So they. So at the very least, they need to figure out how that stuff uh, interacts with the human body, so that maybe they can figure out uh, some mitigation, you know, procedures or whatever. Like that pill that I can't remember the name of, but definitely is a thing that we'll probably get to. We have to mention this part, folks. Obviously, the government could illegally experiment on disadvantaged populations. They have certainly done so in the past. And there are people who will assure you that the experiments like this continue in the modern day. But there's a problem with those experiments. Sometimes they have survivors and survivors have a tendency to, you know, talk to people about the horrible things that happened to them. And so Project Gabriel led to a classified program called Project Sunshine in 1953. It started out as just another secret investigation, which is a weird sentence to say, but accurate. And then it quickly took a dark turn. Do not let the name fool you. In fact, let's let Dr. Libby himself introduce his project with this infamous quote. This comes from a secret meeting in 1955 when he was talking about the importance of getting humans to experiment on. I don't know how to get them, but I do say that it is a matter of prime importance to get them, and particularly in the young age group. So human samples are often of prime importance, and if anybody knows how to do a good job of body snatching, they will really be serving their country. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Wink, wink. We need young bodies. Let's go snatch some. Anyone good? Yes. We exactly. got your back. We got your back. And the, the, the bluntness, the candid nature of that statement really stood out to me. And I, I hope it stands out to everybody listening, because with that... The U.S. government got into the business of stealing the corpses of children. That is what today's episode is about. And that's part of why it got to me. This wasn't a small operation. This was a global network. Sunshine created an invisible army of modern day resurrection men, literal corpse thieves. And we uh, we talked about resurrection men in the past, but uh, somebody uh, give us the quick and dirty, just because it, it's such a cool term for such a horrible thing. Yeah, I mean, it was it was especially um, during early days of, say, medical experimentation, you know, when um, surgeons were trying to figure out how, you know, the human body and the human anatomy functioned. Uh, so in order to do that, they would often grave rob and then dig up corpses and cut them open to see what what's what. Yeah, nailed it. It's just like a, we. I think we talk about it at length in our episode on whether or not Benjamin Franklin was a serial killer. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the resurrection men uh, came about be, because of gaps and loopholes in the laws at the time. Like it was legal to conduct medical experiments on cadavers, but it was illegal to buy them. So you just have plausible deniability Get some creepy and or desperate person to, like Noel said, rob a grave for you. And then you just pretend like, well, I don't know where this body came from, officer. I'm just trying to learn about kidneys. What do they just have like a body drop off repository, like the return thing at a library? Like, I mean, what? I, I, I mean, I know we're going to get there, but geez, this is bleak. Yeah, uh, it's true. Uh, this was a massive operation, even if even if it was just sort of an implied operation, right? Um, there were project managers who didn't want to disclose the actual nature of the research that was being done. Because if they did, then it could put their personal contacts and the people that were helping them out who were essentially breaking the law at risk. 
Um, so they decided to have researchers use uh, people that they knew to recruit other people to do more of this stuff. Yeah, degrees of separation. That's how it works. I mean, that's that's the brilliant part about surveillance programs like Five Eyes. This network operated everywhere from Australia to Europe through various means. And we still don't know the extents of this. We still don't know the specifics, but through various means, by hook or by crook, pieces of dead human beings were being stolen and they were being shipped off to the U.S. It seems that many of the governments of countries involved had no idea what was happening. Um, and that's that in itself is pretty distressing. And it's an important point uh, that, that you make here because some of these people who were gathering samples, like you said, they were contacted informally, you know, kind of off the books operation, like, hey, just between us, you want to help me steal some bodies? What are you doing Wednesday? Uh, they They were given different reasons for this too, because the folks in charge of Project Sunshine didn't want everyone to know this was a program related to nuclear weaponry. So they made up a couple of different reasons. And that means that not all the people involved in this network understood exactly why they were shipping these these samples uh, to the U.S. And there were a lot of samples. This was not a one and done thing. This was not a tragic case of like, half a dozen very unfortunate families it was way deeper and way more extreme. Yeah. Uh, according to the documents available that, uh, you know, are declassified on this stuff, there were at least 1500, I believe samples. Uh, I'm not doing the sound cause I keep, I'm, I'm going back and forth between whether or not to do that sound, just depending on uh, the listener's reaction. Sometimes it's like, I love it. Give me some swish swish. Sometimes this man, leave me alone with that swish swish. Yeah, but Matt, you just described like the internet, you know? I mean, people are going okay. to... Yeah, <laughs> educate yourself, bro. <laughs> oh, dang. No! <laughs> the tables have turned. Okay, so whew, let's get back to seriousness. There were over 1,500 samples of human flesh tissue. A lot of them were from babies and young children, as was stated by Dr. Libby. That was important. Um, again, they were stolen from all around the world. And here's the weird thing. And I, I, we can't tell you if it's just what was reported, you know, and what was put in official documents by people who are keeping track of this stuff or or not, but allegedly only 500 of those samples, so one third, were actually tested for the purposes of Project Sunshine. Which in itself, it's its own kind of heartbreak, you know what I mean? All this for nothing, for so little. It, it reminds me of our discussions about Unit 731 in Japan, or some of the atrocities committed by German scientists during World War II, there was some useful science that came from this. But the, the big misconception that a lot of people have is that this science was incredibly impactful or even good science. The events of 731 were, it was an abattoir. It wasn't a lab. It was a charnel house. Yeah. And the parents, you know, of, of, of these children had no idea what was going on. Look, it's one of these things where it's like, do the means justify the ends? It's sort of like black ops and stuff where clearly laws are broken uh, to the greater good, for the greater good. Uh, but then when you start seeing things like only 500 of these 1,500 samples were analyzed, you start to be like, well, what, why, why did they need so many? And then why was it such a widespread operation? Because it really is uh, absolutely abominable behavior, uh, at least for people that – are religious. Can you imagine finding out that your child's, you know, body was desecrated, dug up, used for science experimentation? Well, that that's actually kind of where I want to, I, I will we'll hit it more at the end here, but I wonder if transparency would have changed people's thinking. Mm. There was a, there was a lot of patriotism going around for a long time in the United States after the second world war. And I wonder if instead of doing it, you know, in the dark, surreptitiously stealing bodies, it was, hey, we we really need to test this powerful weapon and the right. effects of it for the safety 
of national security for our the strength as a union. Right. <laughs> we need you or children's corpses. Because right. because you know at least they're not asking for your firstborn or your young the way or it, it, they're not killing children and torturing children and people as in unit 731 they are definitely experimenting on the thing that was once a loved one yeah um it, call it project herod sure you got to wonder too i'm picturing the scenario in my mind where you know like a representative comes and knocks and says um, mrs jones we we have a your country needs you there's a thing you could do to really help us out um we're here to ask if we can you know honor the memory of your child by uh, having it serve and potentially save the lives of millions. Right. Good line. Yeah. That's, it's something that occurred to me as well. And it's one of the, one of the closing things uh, we can really dive into uh, toward the end of this episode. So let's pause for a moment for a word from our sponsors, and then we'll return uh, with some examples of how, this process occurred. And we're back. Uh, there's a British documentary we'd like to draw your attention to. It came out in 1995. It's called Deadly Experiments. In Deadly Experiments, uh, one of the people interviewed is a woman named Jean Pritchard. She is British. She had a child that was stillborn in 1957, and she learned that when her child, uh, when, when she gave birth, uh, the doctors who spirited the child away removed its legs and sent those legs off to the U.S. for Project Sunshine. She was forbidden to dress her daughter for the funeral because the doctors knew that if she did, she would find out what happened to literally half of her child. She also continues, and she says, I asked if I could put her christening robe on her, but I wasn't allowed to, and that upset me terribly because she wasn't christened. No one asked me about doing things like that, taking bits and pieces from her. And that, you know, that goes, that ties in exactly to what you're talking about with the idea of religious practices, you know what I mean? These are these are some of the most important sacred traditions in a lot of belief systems. And it words like we're we're three guys who are paid to talk. And words fail me to try to describe the profundity of that experience. I mean, imagine you have you you have a stillborn child that is an emotional trauma that will follow you like a shadow for the rest of your days. And then on top of that tragedy, you learn that your child's body has been desecrated in the name of nuclear war. So, and it continues. So, okay, even Canada and the UK for a number of years had alleged that thefts like this occurred, but there wasn't an official investigation for decades. It wasn't even until 2001. Remember, this stuff was happening like 1953 to 56. It wasn't until 2001 that Britain's Atomic Energy Agency acknowledged that they were stealing the bones of children, which, you know, to, to the point of a fairy tale, this sounds like a fable. This sounds like folklore. This sounds like a, a boogeyman, a monster from ages past. No, you're, you're absolutely right. So what happens to the bodies of the people that we love when they're gone? Um, there are obviously options. You have things like cremation and burial, embalming. Um, but it's not like you end up with some sort of inventory or a checklist of what happens to Organs. I, I, I only say this because uh, I, I've been watching Six Feet Under a lot lately. Apparently, when a body is picked up from the morgue uh, or after an autopsy, you know, by a uh, an embalming um, service or, or company or uh, funeral home, there is absolutely a checklist. Like, if for example, if someone was in a you know accident where parts were severed, um, there is a checklist for things. There's an episode involving a severed foot that points that out in six feet under but we don't get that 
we could probably request it, but we don't. So it's not like most of us would actually have some sort of checklist as to where the organs especially end up uh, and where different body parts might turn up, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and also think about, you know, think about the the grief that someone is going through. Uh, it's It's easy to understand how, figuring out what happened to specific body parts wouldn't be the highest priority because you're just trying to make it from one day to the next. And regulatory agencies exist in multiple countries to monitor these processes, but the average person doesn't really have a way to learn whether their loved one's body parts are being given a dignified burial in accordance to their religious statutes or whether they're being illicitly taken for other purposes. A few years back, here in our home state of Georgia, authorities discovered this funeral home north of Atlanta was being paid to, you know, do a typical burial service, but they were taking the bodies and just like throwing them in freezers and in the woods. It's, um, these are, you know, this is taking advantage of very vulnerable people at one of the worst moments in their lives. And that that's one of the most frightening lessons about Project Sunshine. That's, I think that's one of the two big things we should keep in mind here. Something like this conspiracy could easily happen again in the modern day. The only reason it's, it, if it's not happening now, the only reason stuff like this is not happening is because people haven't found a rationalization that they felt was noble enough. We are one excuse away. From something like this happening again, and and, and was it necessary? Uh, back to seven thirty one. It's I, I mean, it is crucial to understand the effects of nuclear fallout, nuclear waste. But were there better ways to go about it? Like what you guys were saying earlier. That's what I keep thinking. Like what if you what if you phrased it as this is a way for your family to serve not only your country but the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, like if you check organ donor or something like that on your uh, on your registration or on your, you know, your license or whatever, does that mean th th does this qualify? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's sort of a silly question, but I, I'm not m intending it to be. I just mean. You know, this is obviously extenuating circumstances when, you know, uh, desperate times and all of that. Uh, I'm just wondering if there would be a way to kind of like interpret that as you're an organ donor or, you know, when people say they're donating their body to science, I always like, what does that actually mean? Is that some sort of like writ that you have to create that says which, you know, exactly which uh, research lab you want to donate your body to for a specific project? Or is it just more like, what do you need? Here I am. <laughs> Excuse me. Right. right. I, I imagine there's some way uh, to there, there's some way to specify a, a cause or an experiment or an institution to which you'll donate your body or parts of your body. But I, 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 I don't know my, the closest experience I have had with consensual donation of body parts has been uh, I went through a phase where I really wanted to donate my left eye to uh to someone but there there understandably there there's some <laughs> there's some legal hurdles if you're a guy who's just like I want to give away one of my eyes first question is like well who do you want to give this cornea to and if your answer is IDK LOL then uh they're understandably going to be a little bit weirded out totally but, but it's a serious thing. question why did you not give away your eye it got too complicated, honestly. <laughs> That's the reason. Okay. Uh, and, and also, you know, I, it's something I would still be interested in doing. I mean, giving, giving someone the power of sight is an amazing thing, you know. Um, but also, I wear contacts. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like giving away a car, right? Is, is my, is, is my eye so bad that it would be like giving someone a lemon, a beat up car that they really don't want to drive, you know, and it just sits in the driveway of their skull. Uh, I love that really phrase, good. the driveway of your skull, Then That's <laughs> incredible. Uh, but, but let, let us know about that. Noel, I think you're 
question about organ donation is is really interesting. I haven't thought about it in that way. I, I know, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I think most people our age in this state become organ donors because you, they knock a couple bucks off the license fee. Right, exactly. And again, this all does come down to um as as so much so often burial does uh to religious belief and i think that's the the, the greatest betrayal you know is is in a country where supposedly we prize people's right to exercise their religious you know freedom uh, so highly to betray that trust you know is 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 pretty pretty uh egregious and this goes to our second perhaps most important point no one in this conspiracy saw themselves as villains. No one you know ever does, I mean? right? Right, right. Everybody is the protagonist of their story. And these people who consider themselves good people through through a series of slippery slopes found themselves stealing corpses of children, which makes you think, what lengths would you go to if you genuinely thought you were saving the world? In this case, it was not a hypothetical question. And it's something, you know, it's it's easy to say that these people were monstrous, but then you have to ask yourself, what would you do in that situation? If you thought that you could save billions of people by breaking, by bending them, breaking some ethical rules, would you do it? I mean, what would you prefer to be haunted by is another way to put it. Would you prefer to spend the rest of your life knowing that you literally still corpses? Or would you prefer to be haunted by the idea that you could have saved the world and decided not to? I don't, I don't know an easy way out of that. I don't know the solution there. It's a, it's a weird thing. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm really torn. I'm genuinely torn because I know if someone did that to my son, like if he had just passed away and parts of him were taken away, I would be furious. I'd be I'd be going on a little hunt for the hunt for the uh, resurrection people who took parts of my son. But it's also, you know, scientifically, if you take belief out of it, it's a dead body. And it really is something that, you know, could potentially help. But at the same time, they're researching the effects of nuclear weapons uh, like these terrifying weapons that the research isn't necessarily going to save anybody. Uh, right. I mean, if, if it's a weapon and you just realize, well, we got to protect people from the effects of this weapon. You don't, you don't necessarily need to know how it affects the human body. I don't know. <sighs> Well, I'm, no, like, I'm just crazy torn there. Like I said, though, I mean, it, it's about like trying to figure out how can we guard our population against the use of these weapons by others. You know, and by the way, <laughs> that thing that I was struggling so desperately to remember, it's just it's called um, uh, potassium iodide. And it's just a pill that blocks radioactive iodine from um, entering the thyroid. So it's not quite the same thing. But, you know, they might not have known how that worked if they hadn't studied the effects of that on the human body and knowing that the thyroid absorbs that particular radioactive material. So I, I do get it, uh, but also I'm, I'm wanted to, uh, ask a question, Ben, um, did I miss this or why? So why children specifically, or was that just part of the, you know, part of the whole deal? There were just some ch children involved. Yeah, it was just their vibe, I guess. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a horrible uh, thing to say. Uh, yeah, the the issue was that children would be ch – children of this era would be the first kids born after the creation and deployment of nuclear weapons. So they – like you could – if you took anybody who was born before that time, you would only see the effect of what happened to them – at that moment later in life when they were exposed, you know, and then when they're like 50 years old or something. But if you if you look at children, you're looking at an organism that is new to the environment. So it's, it's kind of like the study of microplastics, right? It was a big deal when scientists found out that microplastics are occurring in human bodies while children are in the womb. You know what I mean? That, that means that it's already something that's with you from day zero. So if you have a stillborn child and you're able to test it 
for levels of things like strontium-90, then what you can learn is that you, you can learn basically whether the radiation or the contamination is ubiquitous enough to enter through another filter. So it's because remember, this kid's just being born. If it's born and it has traces of contamination in it already, that means that this contaminant, whatever it is, be it microplastics or strontium-90, has managed to pass through another filter. It's gone from the environment, maybe to an animal, a cow or whatever, into a human that is bearing a child, and then from that human into the other human inside of them. So there's there's a logic to it, but it's... Um, it's a, it's kind of a soulless logic, I would argue. And and you're right, you know, it's hard to parse this. It's not something with an easy answer. And it it's startling, it should be startling, that investigations are, are kind of ongoing. You know, you would think that this guy would get much more press coverage. It was in it was in the New York Times a couple times. You would think that it got um much more attention or that the American public at the very least, would would be putting more eyes on these kind of classified projects that occur. But for now, what we can say is it's a conspiracy. It really happened. And something like this, based on what we know about human psychology, could easily happen again. Uh, this is a tragedy all around. You know what I mean? There's not, there's, there's not an evil mad scientist in here. There's, there, there's just like, like it always is. There's, there's a mass of terrified, frightened people who are doing their best not to die. What a downer. Okay. <sighs> Who's got jokes? <clears throat> oh yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I have any jokes after that. Doing their best not to die. That's the most emo thing I've heard all week, but it's true. It's all, we're, that's what we're all doing. Yeah. Thankfully it's gotten a little easier, I think. Uh, although these days it's, it's, there's a lot of things trying to kill us. No question about that. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, I didn't know about this project and, and I have to say this, this is such a cliche thing, but how come all of these government projects that are like involving horrible things, all have names like operation twinkle toes mm. and operation Starfruit, fruit operation Capri sun, you know, like they're all horrible, horrible. I understand why they do it. It's like, to, to get people off the scent of like how absolutely horrible and maniacal what's actually going on is. But it's, it, it's definitely an interesting dichotomy when you read about so many of these, right? Yeah. I like to, I know this is not true, but I like to imagine that there is in every government, there's like one person, one lady, one guy, just some generic dude whose entire job is to think up these names and like they, they get up, you know, they get to the office at eight or nine or whatever, and they've got a list of crazy stuff that their government is doing. And then they, you know, like they lean back, they have some coffee and they're like, let's call this one Project Artichoke. I like artichokes. And then let's, someone else. Let's, let's torture some people. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the process. I know it, it can change. You know, sometimes they really like acronyms or initialisms and then. Yeah, like like you said, Noel. Sometimes it's it seems purposefully misleading. Like if we ever hear about a, a top secret government project that's been declassified, and its name is like Project Fuzzy Warm Times and Hugs, mm -hmm. yeah, then exactly. that's clearly exactly. evil, right? It's gotta be. It's gotta be the most evil one. The more snuggly the name, the more evil the project. Um, exactly. I, that's, that's my theory. Um, but no, no, this is something that I think everyone should know about. Um, uh, certainly a dark period in history in general, but also in like weird government conspiracies. And it's far from the only example. Uh, we'd like to know what you think, what lengths would you go to if you genuinely thought you were saving the world? Uh, let us know if you have experience with other similar stories in your neck of the global woods. Obviously, being based in the U.S., uh, we see a lot of stuff that emerges from the U.S. specifically. Uh, but that doesn't mean that other countries aren't also doing 
dastardly things. Uh, we want to hear from you. As always, you're the most important part of the show. So let us know. We try to be easy to find online. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter where we are Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. You can find us on YouTube where, hey, we're Conspiracy Stuff again. Check it out. <laughs> and hey, while you're on the internet, why don't you pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a glowing review. You know you want to. And if it makes us all smile collectively uh, in our hearts, um, then we will read it on one of our episodes. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you if you feel like a... If you feel like saying, I love how these guys always ruin my day with these stories. Uh, Probably not going to read that one. Well, maybe no, that's a, that's a positive. I, I, I see what you did there, Ben. <laughs> and if you're not a person who really sips the social meads, we totally get it. Why not give us a call? We're one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Three minutes. Those minutes belong to you. Let us know what's on your mind. Give us a cool nickname to call you, and uh, most importantly, let us know if it's okay to use your voice or your name on air. If you feel like three minutes is not enough time, we totally get it. Please don't feel like you have to censor or edit yourself. You can tell us your story in full. Write it out. Send us a good old-fashioned email where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.